Our next guests uh, are one, our only, U.S. Congressman Jeff Fortenberry. Uh, Congressman Fortenberry, how are you today? Well, good afternoon. Thanks for having me on the program. Uh, I'm fine. I appreciate it. We're uh, here, I'm here in Nebraska uh, trying to serve constituents while participating in broader policies to try to protect health care and protect individuals and families and protect small business. And in the meanwhile, we just had a hot water heater blow up. And oh, no. Flooding. So, <laughs> Whoa. Glad to talk to you. Oh, man. Well, I hope we don't uh, keep your attention for too long so you can take care of that. I, uh, I have some children here and they're <laughs> moving things out. <laughs> All right, well, then I'll just uh, get right into it, and I'll start you off with this question. So what's the latest uh, going on in Congress to help combat the effects of the pandemic? I hear there's work being done on another stimulus package. What can you tell me? Uh, Possibly. There's debate being done on another stimulus package. Uh, One of the dynamics out there is that states and local communities, particularly Lincoln and Omaha, uh, are seeing an unwinding, um, particularly sales tax revenue, uh, given that small businesses have been so hard hit by the negative economic multipliers of the, the shutdown. So uh, I'm very proud of the fact, though, that in the last bill, uh, $2.2 trillion, again, it went to health care, uh, individual help uh, for families, as well as the Paycheck Protection Program. Nebraska actually leads in the number of paycheck protection loans, and that's really due to a huge public service that has been done by our financial institutions locally who have good relationships with their customers community banking, credit unions, CPAs, financial planners, others have all pitched in. We work very aggressively with the small business associations in the uh, state to get the word out fast. And this has been just a lifesaver. It was a bipartisan airlift for small businesses to to basically assure that once we fight our way past this coronavirus, that our economic well-being is to a degree intact. And that's important. Now, the next tranche of this to your question, though, is about the impacts on state and local governments. So there's a, a big fight, honestly, brewing in, um, in Washington about uh, who should get that money and who shouldn't. Uh, Congress has already appropriated $150 billion to states. That money has not rolled out fully yet. I've been encouraged by something that Secretary Mnuchin just recently said, both Congressman Don Bacon and I encouraged him to do this, but that those monies can also be used for police and firefighters. So that should be some help. There's been grant programs and traditional uh, traditional grant programs have been increased substantially. But again, the next stimulus package may be about more aid to state and local communities. From my perspective, that's a reasonable ask because people, we, we, our state is well run, our, our local communities, our governance structures are well run. In other places, though, across America, they aren't well run. And so Congress cannot get in the business of subsidizing state or local communities who had problems, financial problems, before the pandemic, before the coronavirus, while at the same time trying to be creative to help those who have been impacted by the decline of revenue because of business decline. And then put one more thing in the mix. Uh, it's the issue of liability. Um, if someone has undertaken best practices, an institution or a business, to basically protect their employees, uh, protect their customers, they shouldn't be held liable for any kind of lawsuit. And so that's a part of the mix as well as some additional type of package is coming together. Um, that leads me to uh, a point, and I think you, you mentioned it, that there was a big fight brewing in Congress over this. And my kind of question is, well, how has legislating been like during the pandemic? Are things just as sort of you know partisan back and forth as they've ever been, even in the midst of this worldwide emergency? Or is there a more of a sense of solidarity, or what's been going on? There has been a good sense of solidarity, to be honest with you. Again, as you heard me say a moment ago, this last round was a bipartisan airlift for, for hospitals, for families, as well as this Paycheck Protection Program. Um, you know, very little dissent. Uh, it came together slowly, but in, it, $2.2 trillion is an unprecedented uh, federal intervention in society and the economy. Um, with that said, it was widely supported, widely touted. Uh, a lot of us have been on member calls. That means Democrats and Republicans talking to the administration uh, in an ongoing basis. So overall, there's been general good, um, a good spirit of bipartisanship or, or what your word is better, solidarity to try to get through this crisis. However, uh, as we go on and as these bills pile up, there is a tendency for uh, different political 
philosophical perspectives to start creeping into this, and I'm, I'm starting to see that. And you, and you see this in this debate about how far the federal government ought to go to help local communities versus state communities. Now, let me be clear. I am sympathetic to the argument, particularly by Nebraska communities that are well run, and this pandemic has swept upon them and has been as impactful as them on anyone else. And so there, there, there is a rightful desire and claim here for some, some help. Uh, because, again, they're not trying to fix things that were broken before. But there, there's some – we just need to avoid that any any locale or any state that wants to try to get the federal government to subsidize its poor financial conditions prior to the pandemic, pandemic we're not going there. Congressman Jeff Fortenberry joining us on Road Recovery. Uh, hi, hey, Congressman, it's Jack Mitchell. How are you doing today? Great, Jack. Good. Uh, here's, here, here's my question. We kind of look at so much now, you know, when I'm talking on the morning show, so much of it is looking at the next phases and thinking about the next phases of things, whether it be, you know, where our kids will be in school or will, they'll, will, will restaurants open back up? Will there be football games? Will people be able to go back to their jobs? And so we look at that, and, and I'm kind of wondering – from a congressional perspective, you're obviously in a phase now where there have been discussions and legislation about these st- actions for stimulus. And as you said, and I agree, uh, they've been largely bipartisan, um, largely supported throughout the country. But you're, there's going to have to obviously be a next phase after you get out of the stimulus period for a variety of reasons. But there are still going to be the issues that are out there that you're addressing with the stimulus. What's that next phase? You know, on on COVID medically, you, you've, you've got containment and mitigation. What's the next stage uh, stage for Congress after you get through this stimulus phase? It's a fair question. And in a parallel, you're not hearing anything about the ordinary work of Congress right now, but it is going on a lot of times in digital format. For instance, I'm on the appropriations committee. At this point in the year, we would be well underway in the hearings and oversight hearings of various agencies we have responsibility for. I talk very frequently, for instance, with the head of the Food and Drug Administration, mostly about responding uh, to the pandemic here. But he is uh, the um, what's called ranking member of the Agricultural Subcommittee on Appropriations, basically we control the funding for agricultural policy and food security in the country. So we also have jurisdiction over the FDA. So that's a little bit narrower lane, but the other thing that I mean is on state and foreign operations. Look, the world keeps going on, even though we're all dealing as an international community with the impacts of the virus. Uh, a friend of mine who is, by the way, a former, um, he was on the road to becoming a jihadist. Uh, he had some sort of conversion of conscience and got away from any very courageous Egyptian man. Uh, we just sent out an article, for instance, about how ISIS is regenerating and even plotting to spread the coronavirus about uh, through individual contact, just bizarre things like that. So the, the world goes on. Uh, but right now, the appropriations process is running uh, as an undercurrent to the broader policy considerations. And what that means is just the ordinary aspects of government, whether that's agricultural policy, certain considerations in state and foreign operations and national security are operational. Uh, for instance, this week as well, uh, right in our backyard here, we have Stratcom. That is one of America's would be America's most powerful pieces of military infrastructure, and it's right here um, in Bellevue at off at Air Force Base. So I was in contact with the commander there uh, on the coronavirus virus issue, but this doesn't slow down their operations. They are busy protecting America. So we'll, we have to do this in parallel. The, the primary consideration now is to get past this crisis to move as quickly as we can to better treatments. I'm really proud, by the way, of the University of Nebraska's med system for medical centers for a variety of reasons, being a leader on treatment. Uh, we have been working with them aggressively over the last few weeks to try to roll out a suite of products, a suite of options that a, a business or an institution could use to make sure they're protecting their people. It's what I call SSTP. It's uh, screening, sanitation, social distancing, testing and testing for the virus, as well as the, the virus antibodies. The uh, University of Nebraska now has a suite of products in which they can roll out to help institutions. So it's kind of a both and to your question. The main consideration is dealing with the crisis, trying to think constructively through how we, again, protect our health care system and make sure that we are economically viable once we fight our way through this, um, at the same time running the regular affairs of government. 
Congressman, while we still have some time left, I would like to shift gears and ask you a little bit about China. Um, now, I've heard conflicting messages repeatedly about how culpable China is in the spread of this virus. The most recent reports are saying that China downplayed the severity of the virus to stock up on personal protective equipment before it spread to the rest of the world. Uh, from what you know, from what Congress knows, how much responsibility does China have for this pandemic as we start to move forward? China was more interested in controlling information than it was controlling the virus. That's the bottom line here. Now, there's a lot of theories as to where the virus is coming from. The predominant theory in the scientific community, in my dialogues with the experts, is that it came from this wet, live animal market, uh, from a, a, a bat animal transfer to humans. Uh, there is still some suggestion, though, that this could have been leakage out of the Wuhan biological uh, laboratory that they have there. Uh, and by the way, an interesting fact is we are about 40 percent dependent on our drugs that come to, in, in America, come into America, come from China. About 80 percent of the drug ingredients come from China. We've seen how difficult it has been. We've all learned a very hard lesson about how vulnerable, vulnerable we are in terms of protective equipment, a lot of which comes from overseas and China as well. All of this is going to change very, very soon. And Congressman. Uh, Congressman, actually, I'm glad you mentioned that because that leads me right into my next question and that you've said before on this show, part of the recovery will have to include an effort to sever America's dependence on China for this type of equipment. Um, what's being proposed in Congress to accomplish that goal? What are you thinking? Uh, the nature of the relationship is going to shift and shift dramatically. We basically outsourced a lot of our manufacturing to China. Now we find they're highly vulnerable on drugs as well as protective equipment. Again, prior to the coronavirus pandemic, we were raising the issue about the overdependence on drug supply, mainly in the terms of safety. We can't guarantee the safety of drugs coming out of there. So that's one step that Congress will likely take quickly. In fact, we're already getting pushback, which is a good sign that this is making big pharmaceutical companies nervous, who, again, shifted most of their production there for lower labor costs and lower environmental standards. And again, our inspectors are not up to the task making sure that those drugs are safe. We require spot infections here of our manufacturing facilities, but we have to give 12 weeks notice in, to Chinese officials. That is a double standard. It makes no sense. It's wrong. It's going to all stop. So I think there's going to be a big move, a reshifting of an understanding of what trade ought to be. We, we don't want any kind of trade war or difficulty with China in that regard, but we have to have trusted trading partners and keep leaving ourselves vulnerable to the machinations of the Chinese, uh, particularly in our drug supply, it's going to end, as well as our medical equipment. It needs to be made in America, and I imagine that this is one of the areas that will be very addressed very rapidly by Congress. And China is an adversary. It's a, it's a rival. It's also a very important strategic partner for the U.S., I'm sure, and the rest of the world. And so what do you know about talks among Congress about retaliation against China for any part they might have played in the spreading of the virus? Look, we've already, we, we're losing this trade war to China. We've lost it a long time ago. $400 billion trade deficit. Again, movement of our manufacturing over there. Uh, Chinese companies, uh, state owned companies basically are required to own it. anything that America has there in the terms of majority ownership. Uh, a lot of the I guess largesse, economic largesse that China has built up is going to be used for military buildup. It's really not the best situation that we're in this really dysfunctional relationship. And it, ought, it needs to be reset. It needs to be fair. We have to have standards that are agreed upon. We have to have a trusted, reliable trading partner if we're going to do it at all. Which means that if we can't get there, a lot of manufacturing should and ought to shift back to this hemisphere. And I, I think that will position America much better. So um, it, it's unclear. Your question is not clear exactly as we probe our way forward, but the nature of the relationship is under great stress. It's conflicted, as you just said. Uh, China is a major power, superpower, status nation. That's a reality. That's not going to work. We need a robust diplomatic dialogue with China, and we need to continue to point out the repression of the Communist Party against their own people. Uh, we have dissidents who come here, who have fled here, who have escaped here, who are golden-hearted people who long for a China that's open and free and celebrates its uh, extraordinary culture. But the controlling hand, the autocratic controlling hand that represses human rights, that pollutes the environment, that controls
controls the economy in the name of this economic nationalism, which is on the march to where? Nobody even knows. And in the meanwhile is leaving us vulnerable. That paradigm is going to shift and will be unpacked in specific ways, probably first with our overdependence on them for drugs and protective equipment. Congress. That's a vulnerability. Just like our military equipment is made in America, protective equipment, medical supplies, and drugs need to be made in America. Congressman, just a couple of minutes left. I just want to ask an ag question here. I know Senator Fisher came out and called for an investigation into anti-competitive behavior in the beef supply chain in the Senate. Is that something you'd like to see in the House? Yes, uh, this is actually already underway at the USDA. Uh, I pointed that out this week. Uh, we have uh, basically four major meat packers controlling over 80% of that market. I just got off the phone with one of my major uh, cattlemen, cattle producers in Cumming County yesterday. Um, when you're losing $400 a head, that doesn't work very long. And while prices are going up in the grocery store, they're falling for farmers and ranchers and cattlemen. What kind of sense does that make? So investigating this control and uh, is, is an important dynamic inside the USDA, and we eagerly await their results, and I hope they'll release them publicly. Uh, Congressman, thank you for joining us again today on the road to recovery. Uh, we are all out of time, but you've been a great Great guest, as always. Thank you again. Uh, you're kind to talk to me anytime. Glad to be here and, and have a dialogue. We're here to help. All right. Take care.